Blessed be our God. Amen. Almighty God, we pray you graciously to behold this your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed and given into the hands of sinners and to suffer death upon the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. See, my servant shall prosper. He shall be exalted and lifted up and shall be very high. Just as there were many who were astonished at him, so marred was his appearance beyond human semblance and his form beyond that of mortals, so he shall startle many nations. Kings shall shut their mouths because of him, for that which had not been told them they shall see, and that which they had not heard they shall contemplate. Who has believed what we have heard? And to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? For he grew up before him like a young plant and like a root out of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by others, a man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. And as one from whom others hide their faces, he was despised, and we held him of no account. Surely he has borne our infirmities and carried our diseases, yet we accounted him stricken, struck down by God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole and by his bruises we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, and like a sheep that before its shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By a perversion of justice, he was taken away. Who could have imagined his future? For he was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. They made his grave with the wicked and his tomb with the rich, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him with pain. When you make his life an offering for sin, he shall see his offspring and shall prolong his days. Through him, the will of the Lord shall prosper. Out of his anguish, he shall see light. He shall find satisfaction through his knowledge. The righteous one, my servant, shall make many righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he poured out himself to death and was numbered with the transgressors. Yet he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. The word of the Lord. Please join me in reading the psalm responsively by half verse. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but you do not answer. Yet you are the Holy One. 
Our forefathers put their trust in you. They cried out to you and were delivered. As for me, I am a worm and no man. All who see me laugh me to scorn. He trusted in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb. I have been entrusted to you ever since I was born. Be not far from me, for trouble is near. A reading from Paul's letter to the Hebrews. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. He also adds, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil consciousness and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and good deeds, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of the Lord. The passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Whom are you looking for? They, they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am. was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. 
The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Caiaphas, who Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon, Peter, and another disciple followed Jesus. Since the disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple who was known to the high priest went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police had made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. <coughs> Peter also was standing there with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples, about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus on the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anna sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off sassed. Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, What accusation do you bring against this man? They answered, If this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves, and judge him according to your law. The Jews cried out, We are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus, and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you ask this on your own, or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, am I? Your own nation and the chief priests have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus replied, My kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, <laughs> my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, 
is truth. After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no case against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, Not this man, but Barabbas. Oh, Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head. And they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him up to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief priest and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now Pilate, he heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, Here is your king. And they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but the emperor. Then he handed him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. It was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. 
Then the chief priests and the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill the scripture says, that they divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. After this, when Jesus knew that all was now finished, he said in order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of wine on a branch and vice <coughs> up and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head, and he gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great, of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus, they saw that he was already dead. They did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this was testified, so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things have occurred, so that scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again another pasture of scripture says, They will look upon the one whom they have pierced. After these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission, so he came forth and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had first come to Jesus by night, also came bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took Jesus 
the body of Jesus and wrapped it in the spices in linen cloths according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb which no one had ever entered. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Amen. I spent some years as vicar of an inner city mission in Pittsburgh. And one year, I asked my seminary student to preach on Good Friday. And you have to understand, when you have seminary students, they are so anxious to preach. They will leap at every opportunity. But Janet said, no, thank you. I said, will you be out of town? And she said, no. I said, well, what is the problem? And she said, I'm not really a Good Friday kind of Christian. I'm more of an Easter Christian. I don't have anything to say for Good Friday. Now, you can guess that led to some conversation between the two of us for someone who wanted to be ordained in the Episcopal Church. I'm not a Good Friday Christian. I'm an Easter Christian. I look back on that and I can give her some credit for recognizing in herself something that I suspect many of us unconsciously hold to. She was young, she was healthy, she was attractive, she was popular, she was doing what she wanted, and besides that, she had the gospel. Besides that, she had the hope of eternal life. And I think many of us who live in relative comfort as far as the world goes, maybe can fall into that same kind of complacency. We have all the good things of life, but we also have our faith in our salvation. Isn't it wonderful? We don't want to dwell on the suffering and the death. Bill last night preached and he said, let's not jump to Easter too soon. And I think that's an important thing that we all need to remember. Something is missed if we are not Good Friday Christians. Barbara and I lived in Honduras for uh, quite a few years, and there many of the people, about half of them, wake up every day and they're not sure that they will eat. They go to thankless jobs, if they even have jobs to go to, they live in dangerous neighborhoods without water or electricity, and they live under a corrupt government, they understand Good Friday. It's important to their, it's basic to their spirituality. They do not take it for granted. So on Good Friday, right outside the street where we lived, hundreds of people would do a procession every year. And someone, of course, would be dressed as Jesus, and someone would be the centurion and Mary, and they would go along and people from the church would have booths and they would stop and they would pray and they would sing at each of the stations of the cross. It was integral to their spirituality. If we miss Good Friday, we're missing something integral to our spirituality. If we are only Easter Christians, then when something comes along that throws off all, us off balance when we have some sorrow, some loss, some sickness, some unexpected injustice. Our depth of faith is not adequate to keep us on the right course. One part of being a Good Friday Christian is to have those deep roots of faith. And besides that, we also miss something very important. Just speculate with me for a minute. Let's say that on Palm Sunday, Jesus entered Jerusalem and he began to teach and the Pharisees and the Sadducees and even some of the Romans were so impressed by the eloquence of his preaching and by the compassion he showed in his healings that they said, why don't you just stay here and, and we'll, 
we'll start a ministry and you'll be right here in the temple. And Jesus did that and he stayed there for decades and because he could turn water into wine and because he could multiply bread and uh, fish, he was never without, he was never in need. He was always popular, people would come from all over to hear him and at the ripe old age of 100, he died in his sleep having never been ill and on the third day he came back and said to his disciples, look, I'm alive, there is a resurrection, I was right all along. That would be a good story in some ways, but wouldn't it miss something important? Wouldn't it leave something crucial out? I think the message would be, if we are Christians, if we follow Jesus, we're exempt from the hardships in life. We don't have to be involved in all of that. If we do things the right way, no harm will come to us. And that's not what happened. That's not the way it is. One of the things that Good Friday teaches us is that it cost God something to love us. The sacrificial love of God is shown for us on the cross. Evil exists, loss exists, sorrow exists, death exists, injustice exists. God deals with it. God finds a way to deal with that. God is not exempt from it. God experiences that. Jesus says, the Father and I are one. So if Jesus has experienced rejection and abandonment and betrayal and pain and all of that, it is part of God's being also, isn't it? Isn't that what the Trinity teaches us? When Jesus says, the Father and I are one, what, what's missing there? Jesus and God understand suffering, they take it into them, themselves. It's an integral part of who they are. And that opens to us the depth of God's sacrificial love for us. Sometimes we underestimate that. Uh, let's say that Elon Musk gave each of us who are here today $1,000, all right? That would be kind of nice for us, but what would it say about Elon Musk? Not that much. He would probably earn all that back in the next 45 seconds. And sometimes we think of God that same way, that God is infinite and loving, and therefore it does not cost God anything to love us and to make that sacrifice. It was a little pinprick. But that's not what the crucifixion shows. That is not what we see in the passion. It costs something for God to love us. And that cost gives us some indication of the depth of the passion of the power of God's love which reaches out to us even in our sinful state in our need and takes that suffering onto himself. And not only that, but the same night that Jesus says, the Father and I are one, he prays for us and he prays that we would be one just as he and the Father are one. So what does that open up for us? That means we are to have the same sacrificial love for one another that Jesus has for us. That we are not exercising our faith in order to be exempt from the sorrow and sin in the world. Instead, we are invited to share not just each other's joys and successes, but also to participate in the sorrow and the care and the loneliness and all of that that we see around us. We are meant to reach out to others in sacrificial love. That's the love that Jesus says, I give you a new commandment, love one another the same way I have loved you. It's a deep, powerful, sacrificial love and we are asked to do that love in the same way. That's an important thing for us to remember. And why should we do this? We can do this because We are not just Good Friday Christians, and excuse me, Bill, but I have to leap a little to Easter to put it in perspective. We are also Easter Christians, and Easter teaches us that God is able to handle all that suffering, all that sorrow, all that loss, and redeem it and turn it into something beautiful, something that gives a whole new kind of life to us. It's in that hope that we enter in the sacrificial and passionate love of God and love of one another. 
if we leap to Easter, and I don't want to get too much into Easter because it's coming, you know. Just one example. Here is Thomas, and the scripture tells us that Thomas did not believe in the resurrection until Jesus appears to him and shows him his hands and his side. And it's interesting to me how Thomas re reacts to that. Thomas does not look at Jesus' wounds and say, oh my God, let me get some bandages. That must really, really hurt. Instead, he bows down and says, my Lord and my God. What does that tell us? That tells us that somehow those wounds have been turned into signs of glory. Somehow they've turned into signs of compassion and power and grace and forgiveness and new life. That's what Thomas sees. And that's what we see in Easter. We can take the suffering upon ourselves because it is transformed. And we see that even among ourselves, don't we? If you go to an AA meeting, the people who are most helpful at dealing with those who are struggling with addiction are the ones who have found their own way to struggle with it in a positive way, day by day by day. They are the ones who have been transformed and can provide encouragement and love and support. My childhood friend uh, lost a beloved four-year-old grandchild to cancer. And it was a real challenge to his faith. It really hit him so hard. But do you know what he does now? He is retired, but he spends all his time at St. Jude's Hospital for Children in Memphis, encouraging the children who are there, encouraging the parents, encouraging and praying with the grandparents. He knows what it is to go through that loss, but it has transformed him. It's given him a grace and a depth and a compassion that he did not have before. Good Friday teaches us the passionate, sacrificial, costly love of God towards us, and it invites us to participate in that love in the hope that we will know the joy and power of the resurrection. If we are just Good Friday Christians, we're going to be unbearable, self-righteous martyrs self-styled martyrs and, you know, who are just miserable all the time. If we're just Easter Christians, we become complacent and try to find a way to distance ourselves from the pain and sorrow and injustice in the world because it's not going to touch us because we have Jesus. It's when we are Good Friday and Easter Christians that we can experience the fullness of the gospel. Christ has died. Christ is risen and Christ will come again. Amen.
Dear people of God, our Heavenly Father sent His Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, that all who believe in Him might be delivered from the power of sin and death and become heirs with Him of everlasting life. We pray, therefore, for people everywhere according to their needs. Let us pray for the Holy Catholic Church of Christ throughout the world, for its unity in witness and service, for all bishops and other ministers and the people whom they serve, for Jose, our bishop, and all the people of this diocese, for all Christians in this community, that God will confirm his church in faith, increase it in love, and preserve it in peace. Almighty and everlasting God, by whose spirit the whole body of your faithful people is governed and sanctified, receive our supplications and prayers, which we offer before you for all members of your holy church that in their vocation and ministry they may truly and devoutly serve you through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for all nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them. For Joseph, the President of the United States, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for the members and representatives of the United Nations, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and truth and live in peace and concord. Almighty God, kindle, we pray, in every heart the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who suffer and are afflicted in body or in mind, for the hungry and the homeless, the destitute and the oppressed, for the sick, the wounded, and the crippled, for those in loneliness, fear, and anguish, for those who face temptation, doubt, and despair, for the sorrowful and bereaved, for prisoners and captives, and those in mortal danger, that God in his mercy will comfort and relieve them and grant them the knowledge of his love and stir up in us the will and patient to minister to their needs. Gracious God, the comfort of all who sorrow, the strength of all who suffer, let the cry of those in misery and need come to you that they may find your mercy present with them in all their afflictions. And give us, we pray, the strength to serve them for the sake of him who suffered for us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all who have not received the gospel of Christ. For those who have never heard the word of salvation. For those who have lost their faith for those hardened by sin or indifference, for the contemptuous and the scornful, for those who are enemies of the cross of Christ and persecutors of his disciples, for those who in the name of Christ have persecuted others, that God will open their hearts to the truth and lead them to faith and obedience.
Merciful God, creator of all the peoples of the earth and lover of souls, have compassion on all who do not know you as you are revealed in your son, Jesus Christ. Let your gospel be preached with grace and power to those who have not heard it. Turn the hearts of those who resist it and bring home to your fold those who have gone astray, that there may be one flock under one shepherd, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us commit ourselves to our God and pray for the grace of a holy life, that with all who have departed this world and have died in the peace of Christ, and those whose faith is known to God alone, we may be accounted worthy to enter into the fullness of the joy of our Lord and receive the crown of life in the day of resurrection. O God of unchangeable power and eternal light, look favorably on your whole church, that wonderful and sacred mystery by the effectual working of your providence. Carry out in tranquility the plan of salvation. Let the whole world see and know that things which were cast down are being raised up, and things which had grown old are being made new, and that all things are being brought to their perfection by him through whom all things were made, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Save us and help us. We humbly beseech you, O God. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Behold the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world.
And now as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, we pray you to set your passion, cross, and death between your judgment and our souls, now and in the hour of our death. Give mercy and grace to the living, pardon and rest to the dead, to your holy church peace and concord, and to us sinners everlasting life and glory. For with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign, one God, now and forever.